Isaiah. We'll look at chapter 33 through 35. And once again, we, we see the judgments and tribulations that are taking place during the time of Isaiah the prophet with the southern and northern kingdom of Israel as God is judging them because they wouldn't keep his commandments or his laws, his precepts, his statutes, as Psalms 119 tells us that they should have. And so he brings judgment uh, against them using other nations. But then he also judges those other nations because of their cruelty towards uh, his chosen people Israel, who he's stirring up and bringing them back to uh, Jerusalem there and rebuilding of the temple and having a relationship uh, with him. Of course, a legal relationship, legal in the sense that they're, they're keeping the law, the sacrifices and, and so forth and maintaining those things that God has commanded them to do. And so in, the, in chapter 33 of Isaiah, we see a continuance of chapter 32 where the Lord delivers Jerusalem. And we see his judgment, but in his judgment we also see his graciousness. It's difficult to see that because you're being judged. But at the same time, God is being very gracious to Israel. And in the same way, he is to us too, right? He judges us, but in a sense, he's really gracious towards us. Because if he were to really judge us for what we deserve, we would be condemned completely, but his judgment is limited in that uh, it brings about grace in trying to draw us back to him. And that's who God is. He's always looking to be gracious to us, and not necessarily to judge us, but if it means it, that it would bring us back, he will judge us, and Hebrews tells us that, right? That he does chastise those whom he loves. You know, And if he didn't chastise us, uh, then we're not his children. And that's a scary place to be, especially when you think you're a believer, but you're never chastised. And you're going along in life with no problems, and you're living life, and you're living it like the world, and you don't see any problem with it. You're not convicted by some of the things that you're doing that, that others are convicted by. Um, you think you have the liberty to do certain things, and, and you're not being corrected for it. And that's a scary place to be. And God's not chastising you. And it it's probably because you're not his child. And so you're still in the hands of Satan and he's got his grip on you and he's deceived you. And so discipline is good. Judgment is good in that it reveals to us that we do have a gracious, loving father who cares about us enough to correct us when needed. Though we don't like it, right? I mean, that's what Hebrews says, though it's not pleasant at that time. And boy, it's not pleasant um, I know when I would chastise my, my children, uh, they weren't rejoicing. <laughs> you know, it wasn't something they looked forward to. And they weren't telling their friends, oh, guess what's happening tonight? I'm going to get chastised tonight and get a whipping, you know, and I'm looking forward to it. No, it's not something you look forward to. You know, it's something that you want to run away from, you know, and as far as you can. But it showed them that I love them enough to, to correct them. You know, and so as fathers and parents, we do the same thing with our children. We should anyway. Parents that don't correct their children, that don't chastise them, are, are not good parents. And I'm not saying that to you personally, but a good parent cares enough to correct uh, their children, just as God does of Israel. So we see here some woes uh, against Assyria, the Assyrians who attacked Israel. So let's go ahead and, and read through these, these few chapters here. Verse 1. Woe to you who plunder. Now, those who plunder are the Assyrians. They're plundering Israel. They're, they're taking their, their wealth. They're taking their material things. They're taking the people and they're bringing them into slavery. And they're plunderers. They're takers. Uh, you know, they're not givers. Um, <clears throat> that's what plunderers do. They, they, they just take. Um, and there are nations that do that. They just take. I think of the Muslim nations. They're... they're they're here to overtake. You know, they're here to to take the world. And it's funny how from time to time in, in history you find men that are takers. They're not satisfied in having what 
God has given them, they want more. And so you get Alexander the Great who wants to rule the whole world, you know. You get the Roman Empire who wants to rule the whole world. You get Genghis Khan who wants to rule the whole world, you know. You get the Assyrians who want to rule the whole world, you know. And so forth. then today it seems to be the Muslims, they, they, they want to get all of Britain and they're getting close. And now America, and they're moving in very uh, speedily in America, changing things so quickly because they're plunderers. <clears throat> they're plunderers, but plunderers will always be judged. And so woe to you plunderers, though you have not been plundered yourself, and you who deal treacherously, though they have not dealt treacherously with you, when you cease plundering, you will be plundered. When you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you. <clears throat> And so the Assyrians were the plunderers, but according to God's principle, he has given us in the book of Galatians that whatever a man uh, sows, that shall he also reap. And there's that principle, right? Uh, we call it today, and if you go to school, then it's the um, it's a principle that that cause and effect. You know, we use those terms. Uh, well, it's the same type of principle. You. You sow something, you're going to reap something. And if you sow to the Spirit, which we all should be sowing to the Spirit of God, that is praying, going to church, studying, reading, you know, those type of things, and then we're going to sow spiritual things, spiritual blessings. It's a principle there. But if you sow to the flesh, then you sow fleshly things. Uh, the thorns, the thistles, you, you, you sow discord, you know, in, in various things. And so because of that principle... Uh, God is basically telling the Assyrians, look, you plundered, you're going to be plundered. You've acted treacherously, they're going to act treacherously towards you. And so it's a principle for us to realize you know, how we handle things in this world. Uh, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, He says, Judge not that you not be judged. Now everyone stops right there, right? You know, the world stops there. They love that, that verse you know, judge not least you be judged, you know, so don't judge me. In other words, you know, I, I, I may be taking drugs, you know, I may, I may be doing things that I shouldn't be doing, but don't judge me. You don't have a right to judge me because the Bible says, judge not least you be judged also. But they don't continue to read because the Bible says immediately after, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So what it's saying basically is that when you judge, judge rightly. And judge with a proper measure, you know, to correct and, and to discipline or to instruct, you know, in a right way. So that when you're judged, God will also judge you gently and lovingly and caringly also. It's not saying don't judge. It's saying when you judge, judge correctly, judge righteously, judge lovingly. That was a, a prayer of mine this evening before we... And begin the service today, we, we always pray at 6.15 uh, for the service for you, uh, for the word to go out and so forth. And, and one of my prayers was is that, that we as a body of Christ are, are able to, <clears throat> to be um, knitted together. You know, in in a sense, and and encouraging one another, and strengthening one another, and correcting one another if need be, in, in things so that we can be effective for God's kingdom. So just being careful how we judge. But this nation will be be plundered, as God said then, and it will be plundered in the end. Oh Lord, so so His people now are are going to pray to God. Be gracious to us, or have favor towards us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. So, so when there's struggles, when there's this great commotion, you know, tumult, uh, people run because they don't want to be a part of it. When you lift yourself up, the nation shall be scattered, and your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar. As they're running to and fro of locusts, he shall run upon them. So what they do when they're in trouble is that they run. They run and hide. But what they should be doing, and as they're doing here now, is they're calling out on the Lord. Oh Lord, come and show favor on us. Great principle, prayer. Calling on the Lord. Asking for help. Looking to God, crying out to God. Boy, did I do that last night, cry out to God. And just praying to the Lord for, for help, for direction, for whatever it is that, that you need. You know, we need to pray. 
And we need to pray more, especially in these last days. I thank God that this church is a praying church. We have people that pray um, in the prayer room during the services while they're going on every Sunday morning. We have people that pray before the Sunday morning service, before the Wednesday night service. Uh, We have a Saturday night prayer here at the church at 7 o'clock. A few come, but it's just specifically for Sunday morning uh, that the word would go out. We have a a once a month Monday night prayer that we can gather together as a body and and pray. So we have a lot of prayer going on. Um, We just recently had that whole week long of of prayer and seeking the Lord, which was, was awesome. So a lot of prayer. And in fact, Paul said that we are to pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5.17. Now, I love that scripture because it tells me that there's no set time for prayer. Now, I know that we can condemn ourselves and feel guilty because we don't get up in the morning and we don't immediately pray. Now, I think that's ideal and I think that we should. Um, we should get up in the morning. We should pray. David did in the morning. He got up very early in the morning. It's good to start your day that way because then it just seems to to, to go very well. But according to Paul, he says, pray without ceasing. You, you're praying all day long. And you should be praying all day long. He's not necessarily saying you have to only pray in the morning. You should pray in the morning, but you should also pray as you're walking in life, you know, and you're dealing with situations. Now, I keep hearing these on uh, these little short stories on the on the radio by several different pastors how how they have encountered those that are really into praying and seeking God on every little issue uh, where they have uh, friends that literally will stop at an intersection and go okay lord which way should i go and they'll wait there until they feel like god's telling them which way they should go you know and that's a little too much you know i know people like that i've i've seen them and they're praying about everything and they won't take a step until they feel God is directing them in a certain direction. There are things that that we just do naturally trusting that God is leading us and guiding us. That's what James tells us that when we ask for wisdom we need to believe that he gives it to us and so we make those decisions and we're trusting and having faith in God that we're making those decisions based upon our connection with him and that he's leading our hearts to make those decisions. Yeah there's times where we need to pray Peter prayed when he was sinking in the water. Lord, help! That was a prayer. The shortest prayer in the Bible. You know, and God heard that prayer and helped him. You know, we can have elaborate prayers. I know guys who have prayed with the old King James language as though God spoke King, old King James and, and so you need to speak old King James to the Lord. You know, the old, thou art worthy thy God, you know, and they're speaking that way and I'm just like, so what, God only speaks that language? And then of course you, you, you come to places that are just uh, really trying to reach reach uh, the this, this certain ethnic groups and so they, they try to reach them in their language and so they're, they're, when they pray, they're praying to the man upstairs. You know? Let's pray to the man upstairs and the homeboy, you know, let, let's, we're praying to you. you know? And it's just like, that's a little, little liberal. You know? We need to have some reverence with the Lord and, and be careful. But praying without ceasing, uh, Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known uh, to God. Now, that's hard to do, not being anxious for anything, because we are anxious, aren't we? Boy, are we anxious, especially when you're hurting, especially when you're in a trial. I don't think there's any of us that, that are not anxious. Um, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of faith, a lot of trust not to be anxious. Uh, I wish I could say that I don't get anxious, but I can't say that because I do get anxious. When you're going through something, it's hard not to get anxious because you are going through something that you don't know what the result is going to be in the end. It might be horrible. You know, now, some will say 80% of what you think will happen probably will not happen, and that's true. I, I agree with that 100%. But again, the way our minds work, we're thinking of the 10% that might happen, you know. And so we get anxious over that. I was anxious last night. Boy, was I anxious last night. Uh, I re-injured my, my hip. You know, my grandson came to me and he jumped on me and hugged me. And, and so I'm hugging him and I just kind of extended my arm out like this. And he grabbed my arm and he put all his weight on my arm, you know, to swing. And I, I put a lot of weight on that right hip. And all of a sudden I felt something like, oh, no, please, no, no, no. I've been working so hard at getting better. But something happened there. You know, I got anxious. I started thinking about starting back at square one. Um, It's going to take me another six months again just to get back to that point. And just all these thoughts just 
And I couldn't sleep. Couldn't sleep at all. Finally, I just said, forget it. I took all my prescription drugs, you know, so I could at least go to sleep, you know, thinking this is it, and, you know, and just all these other thoughts just, fle- you know, just fleshing into my mind, the anxious uh, thoughts. And then praying, and I'm praying, and I'm crying to God, and, and, and like he says here, I'm making my requests known to God and so forth, but the anxiousness is there. It's still there. Uh, I wish that I didn't have that. I don't have it now because I actually feel better. So I think I just he 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 just caused me to overuse it, you know. So it got sore almost immediately, and so I'm hoping we'll see what happens Friday when I go to therapy and start to use it. If it's if it's back to square one or not, I'll just start slowly. But you think of those things when you're going through stuff. It's hard not to be anxious. You literally have to tell yourself, "Okay, God's in control. He knows what's happening. This life isn't forever. You know, one day you'll be in heaven. You'll forget about all this. You know, and you start." putting yourself in the eternity just to get it through uh, that little bit of time. But Paul's correct. We shouldn't be anxious about anything. That's hard to do. But in everything in prayer and supplication, giving thanks, let your requests be made known to God. And then in Luke, he says, uh, Luke, Jesus says, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So in our prayers, we ask the Lord. You know, we ask him, and when we ask him, he says he'll give it to you. And when we seek him, he'll, we'll find it. When we knock, the door will be open. We want the doors open, but we also want them shut if the Lord doesn't want us to go in that direction. <clears throat> See, <clears throat> Israel at this point is no longer trusting, trusting in their own strength. They realize that they can't do it in their own power. And so now they're calling on the Lord. They're looking for his arm every morning to, to hold them up. And so they call on the Lord, as we should too. The praise of God's people. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Now notice something here. Uh, Do we see justice and righteousness today? No, we don't. Uh, They're anticipating this. They're believing that it's coming. Uh, Though it hasn't yet, and it's been quite a few years since they prayed this, and, and we're still praying for that day of justice and righteousness, but we see a lot of injustice in this world. And, and a lot of unrighteousness in the world, and probably more than ever before. Nothing's new under the sun. We see just just as uh, it was back then as it is today. You know, we make a big deal out of homosexuality, and I'm not saying it's not a big deal, but it was a big deal during the Roman Empire too, and it was a big deal during Sodom and Gomorrah. So big that God destroyed the whole whole city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the people with it. He hadn't done that yet, and so. We think that we're the only ones that have gone through that. We haven't, you know. Uh, our government, you know, uh, thank God for it and everything, but there have been governments that, that were worse than our government. The Roman Empire, Alexander, who ruled over his people, who kept them in oppression. Think about the kings that ruled in Britain and, and, and England and, and so forth who kept their people in oppression and kept them impoverished because of taxation and all those other things. Um, it, it's not as bad, but... But these things have always been. But what's interesting is they all seem to be coming at once now. You know, just, just everything from the oppression to homosexuality to abortion to, to the signs in the skies and the wonders and, and various things. And so when we see those type of things happening, we know that uh, we can anticipate that God's soon return and then justice and righteousness will rule and reign at that time. In verse 6 he says, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. Boy, that would be nice. And the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I love that. I love it. You know, you go through scriptures and you see the fear of the Lord and it's his treasure. The fear of the Lord is his strength. The fear of the Lord, uh, you know, fearing the Lord is a wonderful thing. Knowing who he is, we need more of that reverence for God. And so now the Lord's judgment that brings the whole earth... uh, to a, a humiliating position. Surely your valiant ones, uh, that word valiant ones is only mentioned here in Isaiah. Um, now nah, I won't get into that. Shall cry outside, the ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly, the highways lie waste, the traveling man ceases, he has broken the covenant, he has despised the cities, he regards no man. The earth mourns and languishes. Lebanon is shamed, and shivered. Sharon is like the wilderness of Bashan and Carmel shakes off their fruit. <clears throat> uh, we see that in Romans 
chapter uh, 8, I believe, when it talks about the earth moaning and groaning, right, to put on the new earth. Uh, the earth will shake and mourn. I thought there was an earthquake today. I was in my bed and I was studying. I think it was right after Javier uh, called me and all of a sudden the room just started shaking and it kept shaking. It probably went for a good three or four seconds and I'm like, wow, that was a strange earthquake. It, it was just constant and you could feel the whole ground moving and the house moving. And I thought, that is interesting. So I immediately posted on Facebook, just went through an earthquake. I don't know where it's at. You know, and then I started looking up on my little app, Earthquakes, to see where was. there was an earthquake in California, uh, but it wasn't nearby. So I thought maybe that was it. I wasn't sure. So I went out and I told um, Moses if he felt that earthquake. And he said, it's actually the guys working on laminite. <laughs> and they're big <laughs> earth movers. I'm like, oops. <laughs> so I had to repost on there. False alarm, no earthquake. But they moved the earth with those things. It was amazing. Well, when the end comes, the earth will literally be moved. Scary things will take place. He, he announces fire, in fact, upon the, uh, the nation. Verse 10, Now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift up myself. You shall conceive shaft. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you and the people shall be like the burning of lime, like thorns cut up. They shall be burned in the fire. Hear you who are afar off what I have done and you who are near acknowledge my might. So the Lord's going to punish them. Definitely going to punish the Assyrians for being plunderers, and he will plunder them. It's, it's coming. You know, I, I think about how the Lord protects us. <clears throat> He's protecting us right now. Uh, his angels are around us, and his grace. Uh, the enemy is a destroyer. He's a liar. He's a thief. Uh, he wants to literally kill us. And, and if God were to remove his protection from us, I, I think the enemy would take the advantage of it and just wipe us out. I, I really do. That's what happened with Job, right? He, he only allowed him so much, and says, "Don't, don't, t don't kill him. Don't. You're not going to touch him, in, in that way." And so, I think God protects us. We see that with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, the they were thrown into that uh, fiery pit there by Nebuchadnezzar, and as they were in the pit, uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, "I see." Four, didn't we throw three? And yet one looks like the Son of Man. You know, and Jesus was in there with them, protecting them. And the, and the fire was so intense that the guards who took them uh, to throw them in were consumed. You know, well, they went in there and they did not burn through the fire. Now, that is an interesting story. That is an interesting story. How does God do something like that? I don't know. <laughs> I can't say. That were their bodies transformed at that moment? You know, Did they put on immortality? Um, did he have a protection around them? Did their skin become resistant? Be were they superheroes? You know, I don't know. You know. But he did it. I can understand why the world doesn't always uh, agree with us as believers because that's a far-fetched story when you think about it, isn't it? Especially when two guards approach the fire and they're consumed and burned up immediately. Obviously, he did something to protect them. And God can do that. We oftentimes don't think he can do it for us. He can do it for them. He can do it for you. But he can't do it for me. For some reason, he doesn't protect me. But he protects us every single day. He's protecting us from the evil one. And thank God for that. He protects your children. Because the devil wants to kill them. Yeah. He protects your children when they're outside. Now, that's true. And he does. But what, what happens when something does happen to your child? And God forbid that that were to happen. But when something does happen, that's a trial. <clears throat> that's a trial that I don't think anybody wants to go through. But people go through it. Yeah. Losing their child in an accident. Uh, someone taking them. You know, them playing around. Um, something like that. There was a little child I just read about that just uh, died uh, over the uh, Easter, Easter holiday. Um, horrific. I mean, here we are celebrating the resurrection and then all of a sudden your child just, just dies. You know, gets in an accident. I mean, how do you handle something like that? I thought God was supposed to protect them. You know, our perspective as believers, we know that that child goes to heaven. Uh, that's the ultimate protection. They are now protected for eternity. 
they don't have to go through this life you know, with the struggles that we went through. They don't have to suffer. Uh, they don't have to uh, you know, endure what uh, so many of us probably endured or even worse and who knows. But God could have been protecting them from the worst. But you can think like that and, and, and ask yourself, what is God doing in those situations? And I don't know. But he's working things out for good. And that's where trust and faith comes in. You know, and we need to believe and trust in him that he is our protector, just as he protected those three Hebrew children uh, in Israel. It was David in First Samuel seventeen thirty seven, where he said, The Lord who rescued me from the paws of the lions, the paws of bears, and rescued me from the hands of his Philistine. You know, Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And the Lord protected David from Goliath little boy but he saw God's hand working in his life right he protected me from the lion he protected me from the bear the Lord gave me some strength there and so if he can protect me there he can protect me here and that's the attitude that we need to have if God protected the Hebrew boys if God protected David then he can protect me too and I don't have to fear but I'm scared and anxious <laughs> you know but Lord I'm trusting in you that you're going to get me through this uh, Paul said in Romans fifteen thirty one, pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. Paul was delivering the resources to Jerusalem. They were going through a famine. He was collecting for, uh, for them from the various churches in, throughout the areas and he was bringing it to them. But he prayed, Lord, keep me safe so that I can deliver this. And so, really, we're seeking for God's protection on our lives on a daily basis when we pray. Protect us today, Lord. Whatever we're going through, wherever we're driving, whatever we're doing, protect us. You know, because things happen, and we want your protection. So the children of Israel are looking for that, uh, that protection. Then he goes on. In verse 14, the sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearful, fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? So that fire of God consuming them. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppression. Who gestures with his hands refusing bribes. Who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Now these are the people that will not endure the fire. He who dwells on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribes? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception of a stimmering tongue that you cannot understand. Look up, Zion, the city of your appoint, appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will, be, that will not be taken down. Not one of its uh, stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there, the, the majestic Lord will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams in which no uh, gallery with oars will sail, nor majestic ships pass by, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Your tackle is loosed, they could not strengthen their mass. They could not spare their sail. Then the prayer, prayer, prey of great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey, and the inhabitants will not say, I am sick, and the people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. And so God judges the Assyrians. And then we come to chapter 34. And here again we see the indignation of, of the Lord against many of the nations. Uh, we see uh, in the future tense the, the great battle of Armageddon that will take place. Armageddon is that horrific battle that is described in Revelation chapter 19, Ezekiel 38. 
39 really describes it. Good reading. Describe that possibly a nuclear uh, warhead goes off. There might be radiation and men will have to clean up the place. There will be bodies all over the place. Blood uh, is just going to be a horrific, horrific time that takes place. So he says in verse 1, Come near you nations to hear and heed you people. Let the earth hear and all that is in it the world, and all things that come forth from it. For the indignation, and every time the word indignation in the Old Testament mentions, it's talking about the great tribulation period. That seven years that Daniel spoke about, that three and a half years of peace, Antichrist will rise up and he will bring prosperity to the world. And then after that, he will put himself into the Jewish temple and proclaim to be God in his arrogance, just like Satan did. Probably possessed by Satan himself. And then God's wrath will be poured forth on them. So, for the indignation of the Lord is against all nations, and His fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. Also their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpse and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as fruit falls from its fig tree. So, again, he's continuing to think about this judgment against the Assyrian of his time, but he's also describing that a day of indignation when the tribulation comes and we have that Armageddon at the second coming of Christ and all the nations will be gathered together to fight against him. Now, you can only imagine what was going to take place. As all these nations are ready and they've got their jets and planes and nuclear weapons and tanks and guys out there with their guns, you know, and they see Christ coming, what do you think they're going to do? And they start shooting and firing and then he immediately wipes them out. And it says that the blood and the corpses are all over the place. The, the, the birds will come and, and eat upon them. The blood will be so high that it's at the, the bridle of the, of the horse, you know, just all over the place. Um, meteors, here's a mention of the, um, the falling from the fig tree. So it is a reference to possibly meteorites coming down upon the earth as, as Christ is coming at them. So they're firing at Christ possibly. Who knows? I mean, that makes sense. They're, they're ready for war, right? And then all of a sudden Christ just, whoo, all these meteors just come down and just wipe them out. What a scene that will be and we'll be riding with him. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment the sword of the lord is filled with blood it is made overflowing with fatness with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams for the lord has a sacrifice in bazaar and a great slaughter in the land of edom the wild ox shall come down with them and the young bull and the mighty bulls their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust saturated with fatness so you get the idea uh, of the carnage because of this great uh, battle that um, that takes place. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. Now, don't tell me that, that God doesn't judge. We, we like to think of God as a loving God. He cares about us. He loves us. He's gracious towards us. He wants the best for us. But there's coming a time where He's going to judge us. He's going to judge the world. He's also a judge. You know, And we need to not forget that there's the balance there and he does correct us today as we were talking earlier and we want that balance there so yes god is loving but he's also correcting because that's who he is by his love is revealed by his correction in our lives so god isn't always just a loving guy that he lets everything go by Uh, I, i hear that Quite often, people will sin and do horrific things, and, but God loves me, you know. Yes, He does, but He's going to correct you too. And, and God does correct because sin needs to be corrected, and, and, and you just can't get around that. Um, if you're going to sin, then realize that you will also be corrected in that sin. You, you're not going to get away with it very long. God will correct you in, in many ways and facets. Because he loves you and because he's a judge. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, he said. The year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its stream shall be turned into pitch 
and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. So we get some insight to the devastation that will take place during the great tribulation period. Um, before Jesus does return at the end, a third of the earth, the vegetation, the oceans, the, the fresh water, everything will be destroyed. Revelation 8 and 16 are very clear. Uh, it will be unusable during that time. But the pelican, the porcupine, shall possess it. Also the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out over it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. So animals will in habit the places more than there will be people because of the carnage. They shall call its nobles to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all its princes shall be nothing. The thorns shall come up in its places, nestles and bramble in its fortresses. It shall be a habitation of jackals, a courtyard for ostriches. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the jackals. The wild goats shall beat beat <laughs> to its companions also the night creature shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest there the narrow snake or arrow snake shall make her nest and lay eggs and hatch and gather them under her shadows uh, obviously for keeping them cool uh, there also shall be hawks to gather everyone with her mate search from the book of the Lord, and read. And so Isaiah here says, search for yourself, uh, and read it for yourself. Not one of these things shall fail. In other words, not one of these things that has been spoken will not come to pass. You can depend on the word of God. Not one shall lack her mate, for my mouth has commanded it, and his spirit has gathered them together. You can trust in the word. Well, God's spoken, it's, it will happen. You can believe it. It's easy to say something. It's harder to live it. It's easy to say we shouldn't be anxious for anything. It's easy to say that, isn't it? But then try to live that. That's the difficult part. Which is easier to say to this man? Stand up and walk or your sins are forgiven. It's easier to just say, stand, you know, your sins are forgiven. But stand up and walk, that's, that's difficult. And then he gets up and walk. There's the power right there, right? And we all do this. I, I know I catch myself doing this. And recently it just has come to mind as I'm, I'm reading this. You know, the word of God is clear. Um, the principles that we live by as Calvary Chapel, as believers, those principles that we, we set ourselves and they're all good, and we should have them, but the difficulty is keeping our own principles, huh? keeping our own philosophies. You oftentimes hear the phrase, do as I say, not as I do. You know, Because I can tell you what to do, it's the right thing to do, and it's going to be the best thing for you, but I don't do it because it's too difficult for me to do it. But do what I say and not what I do. And that's all of our struggles. Unless you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee, you know, and then you do everything right. <laughs> There's nothing you don't do right. Of course, it's just because you're blinded to your own sin because you're self-righteous, you know, and that's what they were. But when you really see yourself in light of Christ, you know, the light illuminating a dark place, you realize that we fall short, you know, in that area. It's the application of the scriptures that we struggle with. We can understand the principles, we can understand the doctrines, they're easy to understand, but the application is very difficult uh, for us to apply to our own lives. That's the challenge. Let's go to verse, or chapter 35, short chapter. Restoration of the land, the kingdom, blessing earth and humanity, humanity, God will restore everything once again. And, and I love that because there's our hope. That's what keeps us going. Uh, last night, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Lord, <clears throat> I'm back at square one. Why? 
uh, I was so close. Um, that, you know, it, I, it was uncomfortable to lay there because I can feel the pulsating in the hip and, you know, just the uncomfortableness of it all and all these thoughts. And I just kept thinking, I want to just go home. <laughs> I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, why is that? Because we know that's a better place. That's a place where there's no more pain, there's no more suffering, there's no more tears. And so our hope is in that eternal state. And so when we do suffer these things, that's where we're hoping to, to go so that we don't suffer anymore. You know, and of course the enemy comes in and you, you, he starts giving you these thoughts that, you know, just take my life, you know, it's not worth it, I'm done here, you don't need me here anymore, there's plenty of men and women out there they can do your job i'm just one guy you know and all these things just rush rush in there you know and, and that's the difficulty of suffering like that but keeping your eyes on the goal god has a purpose and a reason for it all you know and one day he's going to restore everything thank god for that that's our hope because a lot of us would go crazy you know just as i shared for Easter, the hope of the world. How ironic, huh? I mean, just their hope, you know, their fear of death, you know, and their excuses just accept that we all die. Well, that gives me a lot of hope, you know, because they don't have the answers. There's no e eternal security in their lives. So everything is restored. The land is restored. Look at verse 1. The, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord. The excellency of our God. So after the judgment of these nations that were described in 34, God is going to bring beauty. And God does that. He brings beauty out of ashes, right? <clears throat> He's the only one that can change lives. He, he takes what was dead in us and he brings it to new life. Uh, and then that's the evidence of our salvation is that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Uh, we're not still the old man. Thus we're born again. You know, and we have now entered into the kingdom of God, into a new life. And we really have to pursue that new life. We should be changing constantly. Uh, when we're challenged with our own struggles, with our own sins, we're asking God, help us, Lord, to change there. Help us not to be that way. Help us to, to show forth the newness of your spirit that dwells within us and to give in to you. That's so important to us. That's beneficial for our growth as believers. Um, I think there is a point where we can become anxious for nothing. When we totally give everything over to the Lord and as we grow. I, I don't mean to speak on for Chuck or for his family members, but recently I heard that <clears throat> as from his own daughter on the radio that that he was ready to go home. He was tired. And so even at that point where Chuck was, you know, there was an anxiousness, of, let me just go home, <laughs> you know, I'm done you know, there. And that's what I got from it. I'm not saying that's what happened, so don't quote me on that as I was listening to this. But here's a man that, phew, I don't think I'd ever be close whatsoever to what God had done through this man, you know, millions of people accepting the Lord. He, he, the whole harvest crusade thing was his idea, you know, and so the fruit that's there because of uh, this man's faith and trust in, in God, you know, and being willing to just say, Lord, whatever you want to do, you know, and yet at the end he, he had this anxiousness to just, let me just go home, you know, I'm tired. Because he knew what? That God make all things new, you know, and that's our hope. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. The, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. 
the parched ground shall become a pool in the thirsty land spring of water springs of water in the habitation of jackals uh, where every lay there shall be grass with reeds and rushes a highway shall be there and a road and it shall be called the highway of holiness uh, beautiful words highway of holiness i like that that'd be a neat ministry there a highway of holiness the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray on this highway of holiness. There's safety there. Uh, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenish beast go up on it. It shall be, not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Again, it's this highway of holiness. There seems to be this protection uh, of God that's there as long as you stay on the highway of holiness and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing with everlasting joy on their hands or heads they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sigh sighing shall flee away interesting word there ransom the word ransom there is related to the word goal it's a word that refers to a kinsman redeemer and so as the ransom of the Lord shall return, who is our kinsman redeemer? Jesus Christ. And we see that in the book of Ruth. Boaz, who redeemed Ruth, he was not the next kinsman redeemer in line, but he was able to persuade him not to take Ruth, and he purchased Ruth, in a sense, and took her as his... Um, wife and you know that Ruth is not a Jew but she is a Moabite a Gentile and it's a picture of Christ the Goal the kinsman redeemer taking the bride us to himself and it's a beautiful picture you read the book of Ruth it's beautiful ladies uh, read it and the word love isn't even mentioned once in there and yes it's a whole love story between Boaz and, and, and Ruth there um, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer and you remember the story and how <clears throat> I believe that as a kinsman redeemer, uh, you could uh, take your brother's wife and then you would take everything that was, was theirs. But also what, your, what you had would also be divided among them and their children. And, and so um, there was a ritual that, that basically said that that if you untie the sandals of, of the kinsman redeemer, then you were basically saying, look, I don't want anything to do with this, you know, at all. And, and so that's what happened. He untied the sandals, in a sense, and said, I will become the kinsman redeemer. And so you see this Gaal, Boaz, redeeming Ruth, the Gentile church. And then you go to the New Testament, and then you see Jesus coming and John the Baptist saying, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he, what does he say? I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals because he's not the kinsman redeemer because it was Christ you know, pointing to Ruth. And so a beautiful picture of the Goal uh, of Christ you know, and he has redeemed us. And so he's, he's our husband, right? And he loves us. And he has redeemed us with everything that, that he has. And now it's ours. We've inherited uh, everything that's his in the new kingdom to come. And so our hope is there. Hang on. Stay strong. No matter what life throws at us. No matter what is going on. Whether it's your jobs. Whether it's your relationships. Whether, whatever it is. The world. The taxation. You know. You hang on and you trust in the Lord. People may be after you. Trust in the Lord. Just keep trusting Him and keep going forward and keep serving Him.